trying it again. This is it. <laughs> if it doesn't work this time, well, oh well, we're just gonna go without it today, okay? I'm gonna give it a try. I'm attempting another shot at getting this on. <laughs> we shall see. So let's see what we got here. I see people coming. That's a good thing, right? Hi, Carla. Can you hear me? I think that's a good idea. I've got an idea. Sound now. Okay. How do you like that? <laughs> I rebooted my phone, and maybe it's the phone. I don't know. Yay. Yay, yay, yay. It worked. It worked. It worked. Hello, ladies. Hey, Rebecca. Carla, all of you, yay, it's working. Look how clean everything is, you guys. I am telling you, I have been hard at work. Look at all of that. Those are all my books, <laughs> yes. And a nice clean surface here. I'm not done yet, but uh, you know, I feel good about that. Yay, I love tech issues. <laughs> oh, yuck. Hello, Marguerite and Joanne and Doris. Doris, nice to see you. Heather, yay. Thanks for putting up with me, you guys. I mean, honestly, I just despise tech issues. I find it to be the most frustrating thing. Well, let me just tell you, what I did was I cleaned off everything that this desk is about. I've read most of those books, not all of them. But what I do with the books is I, I pr purchase them for different reasons, you know, obviously, and I, I read everything that I can out of it. I'm still working on it. So I cleaned everything off. I sorted things. I put stuff away. I still have a big stack. This is still stuff that I'm using. Um, anyway, yeah, you know, so, you know, here's the other thing that I did. Um, I, I'm getting ready to do after this broadcast, we are, I'm, I'm, I'm having Mark help me because there's so many pages. Um, even though they're marked, I am printing off the entire book and I'm using it here on this particular table and I'm going to put it all out. I need the visual. <laughs> how, how many of you are like that? I mean, you know, you know, Marla loves to listen to audiobooks and so do I, but I also like to follow along. I get crazy. You know, I can't, I can't just, I wish I could be just one of those people who could do an audible book, but I got to have the visual in front of me because to me, that's when it makes sense. Otherwise, I'll disconnect from something that I heard five minutes ago. I wish it wasn't true that way, but it is for me. That's how I work, you know? Thank you very much. You're cleaning off your desk. You know, it feels good. I, I came through, I wiped everything down. I cleaned everything up. I even fixed my vision board. I want to tell you about my vision board. This is funny. Um, two little words fell off. And one was travel and one was Italy. <laughs> oh my goodness, can you imagine? Doesn't, isn't that just kind of prophetic? So I picked them up and I, you know, I started to get all perfectionistic about it and thinking, oh, I gotta go get the glue and all this. I threw tape on it. So my vision board is, is now visioning me again. It's right there. Yeah, I, I love audiobooks and I love to read as well. I like to do both. And having both there is, is a really good setup. So sometimes I just want to hear it. So one of the, you guys know I've told you about uh, Dr. Joe Dispenza. I'm a big fan of his. Um, his work on meditation is incredible. His work on the brain is incredible. And he's inspired me. Um, I love to listen to his books. He does not do, he does not read his own books. He's got some guy with a, you know, that does the, uh, um, has an English accent, so it's a very lovely accent. I love English accents. My father was British, so I love a good accent. And he reads his book, so I will listen to that when I'm on a machine at the gym or doing it here, you know, put my ear pods in and listen to that. But I'm also reading it at the same time so I can contextually understand everything. And Emily says exactly what, what I think, too. She said she likes to hold and read the books. It's a comfort thing. It is a comfort thing. And I also spend so much time on screens that having, you know, reading off of a Kindle, it's not my idea of a good time. I want the pages. Flip, flip, flip. So there. <laughs> That's how I roll. How are you doing today, by the way? How is everybody on this fun Monday? Aren't you glad that we are having a beautiful Sunday? 
we just had a little teeny weeny storm, just a little pop up water thing come dump a bunch of water. Maybe that was the whole reason why everything kind of got mugged up a little bit, but okay, I can handle it. Um, let's see what's going on here. You want to know what's going on here? We're going to be talking about shame in just half a second because I think it's such a, a thing that we all uh, deal with. I do really, really believe that we all deal with shame in one, in in some way or another. It it just kind of comes into our lives and it and it makes itself known. And sometimes we wear it, and sometimes we hide behind it. And I want to really get into the meat of the matter. Um, Doctor Joe Dispenza, um, D I S P E N Z A Dispenza. You Are the Placebo is one of his books. He's written a couple of others. I've got a couple of them and I've listened to them as well on Audible. Shifted, this is why you hear me talking about the brain so much because your brain is the influencer of your whole life. It's, you know, it. it I wish as a nutritionist, I could say, you know, it's all about the plan, but it really isn't. You know, the plan is just a plan. Until your brain gets behind it, you're not ever gonna, you know, you're never gonna, sign up so to speak we sign up in a in a half-hearted kind of way oh i want that no we don't <laughs> we want our old ways we want our risk-free ways we want our we want our old comfort foods we want our old comfort fill in the blanks changing and doing something new is a threat to our brain and i learned a lot of this from dr joe dispenza he's a brilliant man and i highly recommend his stuff it's heady it's very there's a lot there but he he will inspire you and help you to see things in a way that you probably didn't before at least he has for me and um, I'm a huge fan so here's to Dr. Joe Dispenza somebody was asking me what is this this is a hot milk mix this is exogenous ketones electrolytes and a little MCT puts the whole thing on steroids at one o'clock in the afternoon I start drinking this it's good stuff and it's part of the whole hydration equation. So that is uh, that is something that I highly recommend for everyone because getting hydration in is, is just key to not just drenching yourself with a whole bunch of water, but actually driving the hydration into the cells where they need it. And it takes it takes some doing. So we, you know, that's why the electrolytes are there. This is, and you see, the other thing I did not do is I didn't flip the screen. And I think sometimes flipping the screen, sometimes it makes things a little crazy. So sorry about that. It's backwards. But um, our Get Lean CLA, you can find it at savingdinner.com forward slash CLA. That's conjugated, conjugated um, linoleic acid. And what this is a compound that works very specifically on your metabolism and your belly fat. Lots of Lots of good stuff out of there. They'll say, oh, it's just not, you know, there's not, there's just a limited, you know, research on it. The research that I have seen, I have, it's convinced me that I think this is a good thing. I also take it myself, obviously. This is one of my big things. Um, if you buy three of these, we will throw the fourth one into your cart absolutely free. You just need to put three in. And if you put ships free in the little promo window, we will also ship it to you free. So it's an unbelievable screaming deal. My suggestion is that you get on it. I'm telling you, every time we do this, we run out. Last week, we had all those Bio Omega, we had over 100 Bio Omega um, 3X. This is our, our fish oil. It's That's fantastic. It's a dry fish oil. We did the same thing. We had a whole bunch of it in. It's gone now. It's gone. So take advantage of this. I mean, I'm telling you, get lean. This is something that should be on your regular supplement thing. And by the way, too, if you um, take our supplements and you're saying, well, how do I take them? We have a supplement schedule. And um, you know, you can get it at any time. You can send in and say at support at savingdinner.com and say, I need the supplement schedule, send it to me. We'll send it to you. Um, we oftentimes post it in our Facebook groups, on these chats, um, Jenny's, you know, fast on the draw with all of that, they're here as well. But I'm just letting you know, if you want, if you take our supplements, you want to know how to use them, you want to know how to make a smoothie, you want to know how to do all of these things, we have everything for you. We outline all the reasons why and all the, the wherefores and, and why bees and, and everything else 
um, for for our supplements. So we're we're good about that. And again, you know, everything that we have is because I take it and I believe in it, and I've seen the results from it myself and with clients. So, you know, that's how we roll, baby. Also, you can send an email into support at savingdinner.com and ask to be your question answered on Friday. We do Q&A every single Friday. So if you have a question about nutrition, cooking, or whatever, pretty much I'll answer almost the whatevers, almost all the whatevers. Every once in a while, we'll get a real wonky question in and I'm just like, no, that will not be answered. But pretty much, I'm on it, I'm in it to win it and to help you out. So it's, you know, do it. It's free advice, right? So send it into support at savingdinner.com and in that subject line, um, question for Leanne on Friday. I'll do it for you, I promise. Quote of the week that you cannot see unless you're gonna hold a mirror up. <laughs> Don't get mad about the results you didn't earn for the work you didn't do. That is just a big boom. Every single week we put up a new quote. Sometimes they're just really inspiring, make you feel good. Other times like this, it's like a two by four across your head, isn't it? Don't get mad about the results you did not earn for the work you did not do. We can see a trail of cause and effect in our lives, can't we? The cause equals the effect. So you can see, you know, if you're gonna sit around eating Doritos on the couch and watching Netflix all night playing on your phone, that is gonna have an absolute effect on you. And then you're gonna say, well, I'm so mad because she's getting results and I'm not. I guarantee you she's not on that couch with those that bag of Doritos watching Netflix. Yesterday I went to the gym, boy, you know, and for me to go to the gym anymore is just, you know, with our little community kind of getting hit a little bit with, we've got an uptick is the word. Um, it's, it's an uptick. Uh, so they put in this air system. Um, there's no, there's nobody in the gym. And I just told Mark, I said, okay, I'll go to the gym with you. And I, and I said, if it's, if there's people in there though, a lot of people, I'm just, I'm not. So when I got there, there was no one there. And then another couple came in. This is a big, you know, kind of a big area. But they've got this, I set my my little um, area up with my weights and everything. I had my little plan of what I was going to do. And I just set that whole area up right next to that air thing and made sure that everybody, you know, stayed away. Stayed away. And it was, it was quite effective. I felt good about it. Came home and, of course, took a shower. And I thought, well, is this the only way I'm going to get to the gym? And what if there's people there? And I thought, well, you know what? That's just how I'm going to live my life right now. I would rather be overly cautious than be not very cautious at all and end up with this virus. So that's what I did. People are asking if they can still get the Happy Mama Conference. This is the one we did about getting ready for the school year. Absolutely. Savingdinner.com forward slash mama. It's all there and you'll still get the swag bag. But hurry up because the discount codes are going away tomorrow. Tonight at 12 midnight, tonight at 11.59 is the, is the last time. So get, get that, all right? Also, if you want to take uh, a peek at the webinar that I did this last Thursday, I suggest that you do that because this is going to help you out. This is going to help you with this whole whack-a-mole here, you know? It's going to help you to get the results that you want to get because it's gonna give you a little bit of an insight into your brain. Again, a big nod to Joe Dispenza. It's also gonna give you some insight into what it is that you really need to do. And you're gonna say, aha, I promise you. I've got a lot of people who've said ahas. So, and yes, I have an offer there. I have an offer that we offer to, it's my high-end coaching uh, group. Um, you know, and you don't have to, you don't have to do it. But do take a look at all this. Do take a look at the, the webinar and get take some notes. There's some stuff there that's going to really, you know, it's going to be just like our quote of the week. It's going to make you say, what was that? All right, so I wanted to talk a little bit about shame today because I, you know, every once in a while, if you really want to tick me off, say shame on you to me. Go ahead, do it. Do it. Don't. <laughs> Warning. Warning, red alert, you don't wanna do that. I have had people say shame on you before and it unnerves the living daylights out of me. 
I think I've shared this with you before, but I was bullied when I was a kid. Bullied. Um, really mean. They called me um, Muttley because Muttley was a cartoon dog and how, that I was so ugly and what a dog and this, that, and the other thing. I was beat up in seventh grade horrifically just by my little playmates. Um, beat up on the way home from the, from the, uh, you know, from the bus. Beat up at the at at school by these older eighth grade girls who nailed me in the in the locker room and just scared me. I lived in fear my entire seventh grade year, and it really had an impact on me. It had an impact on me because I was I was ashamed of who I was, and I felt this huge shame in my heart. And it really affected me. And I, I really struggled with living what I felt was like, you know, two lives, trying to just be happy and do my schoolwork and, and all of that. And then living in absolute abject fear that something was going to happen and somebody was going to find out and that the shame would be even more. Nobody knew that this was going on. I didn't tell anybody. I kept it all to myself because I was ashamed that I was getting, ch I was chosen for this being picked on thing. And it, it was weird because, you know, I kind of grew into my, you know, into myself um, when I was in uh, eighth grade and then, you know, through high school, I was, you know, relatively popular and I became a, a cheerleader and everything. So, it, but I still always was worried that somebody was going to find out and say that I wasn't worthy, you know, for whatever it was and that it would never be true and that I'd always be second fiddle. I would always be less than because of this big shame mark. It's almost like, you know, the scarlet letter, <laughs> the A. Well, this was a scarlet letter S on me, I felt. This shame of just being denied um, a friendship because of who I was for whatever reason. And I didn't even understand. They just said that I was ugly, you know? And because I was ugly, I had a really hard time and it had an impact on me later on, had an impact on me with how I felt about myself, how I felt about men and, you know, the things that I put up with because I had this, you know, crazy self-esteem thing. I went through counseling, years of counseling because of this. So I get, um, you know, while I don't get the, the whole spectrum of bullying now and how it's online and, and all of that, you know, we do have an epidemic with bullying. We do, of course, have an epidemic with bullying. But I think the nature of kids to, to bully and to be horrible is just there. It's one-upsmanship is what it is. And it's taking somebody's weakness and using it against them and trying to make them feel awful about just who they are. But I'm gonna talk about shame in today's life because oftentimes what happens is we carry the shame that we've had from our childhoods and we carry that with us and we we actually put it on like a jacket and say, yeah, this is who I am. I was shamed in seventh grade, so therefore I'm still gonna be shamed. The only thing that how shame affects me now is if somebody has the audacity to say shame on you to me because I will become unhinged and I will take them out. <laughs> I will. I will verbally let them have it. And I will expose them, I will take them, I will do whatever it takes to show them that this is never okay. And I don't care what your beliefs are. I don't care if they do differ, you know, night and day from me. I mean, I had people shame me. I had somebody shame me about, you're eating dead animals, that's shameful. You know, you're not saving dinner, you're eating dead animals, that's shameful. Fine, whatever. You know, shameful, no it's not. Let's talk about what shame is. That's so good, Mary. Mary says shame promotes our wounds. It does. It promotes a sense of things that just are not true. We need to look at the difference between shame and the difference between guilt. Guilt is a feeling. Guilt is something that we feel bad about. Shame is something that we put on ourselves sometimes or somebody else tries to anyway, and or we accept it that there is something inherently wrong with us. And that's simply a lie. That is a lie. And that lie is promoted. So when you go and you say shame on you to someone, I'm going to say to you right now, stop it. Do not ever, I don't care 
if they say the worst, most heinous thing ever, we don't shame people. Wise women don't shame people. Wise women might say, hey, straighten up, idiot. This is a dumb thing to do. Or, you know, you're taking people down with you or stop doing this and these are the reasons why. Whatever. But we don't shame people. Shaming people goes to the core of who they are and it is absolutely wrong. We are tender and we're vulnerable. And when we shame what we're doing is saying that you are no good the way you are. That is awful. That is awful. So guilt, we all feel guilty one time or another, don't we? We don't need to live with a sense of guilt or an overwhelming feeling of guilt. We just need to take a look at the one thing that we have you know, guilt about and just say, okay, I feel guilty about that. What now can I do to fix this? What can I do to fix this? You said something wrong, then go make amends. Ask for, ask for forgiveness. Don't just say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry is just a flip. You know, it's just flippant and just, you know, it's just trying to clean things up quickly. It's sort of like you drop an egg on the floor and you clean it up with a paper towel. That's not good enough. You're gonna need to get in there with some soap and water and really clean it up. That's what I'm sorry is. When you seek forgiveness, you're humbling yourself. You're saying, you know what, I, I really, I was wrong. I said something awful to you. Will you please forgive me? I, I do not mean that. I don't mean that. I, I shouldn't have said that. That was wrong. It was a huge mistake, large error, tragic even, and it wounded you. And for that, I am so humbly sorry. Will you please forgive me? And when we do that, you know, we're, we're cleaning the, clearing the decks. And I will tell you, I have done that more than one time with my own children. Because I recognize when I was growing up, my, you know, my parents made mistakes left, right, and center. And we lived in a, in, in a shameful dome of silence, you know, with my dad's alcoholism and running around with my mother who was just bitter and angry all the time. You know, and, and the only sense of normalcy, and I think this is why, you know, I be ended up becoming the dinner table, was cooking in our house and having dinner at the table. That's it. It gave me such a sense of security. It was, the, it was the thing that gave me a sense of security. And more than anything, I wanted to see other families have that. When that, especially when that's the only thread of normalcy you have in your life. When you live in shame, when you live in darkness, you know, not just the shame that the kids put on, but I had a shame also. I had this, the hidden part of my family I didn't want anybody to know about. I didn't want anyone to know. I wanted everyone to think that my dad stayed home at night and didn't go out carousing. I wanted everyone to know, not know that my parents just sat there and drank all night. I didn't want anybody to know any of that, you know, because their parents were normal. Their parents were, everything was great in their households, you know? That's not a whole comparison thing. But Brene Brown, if you've never read Brene Brown or never seen her TED Talk, get on it today. She wrote um, Daring Greatly and Braving, Braving the Wilderness. That was another book that she wrote. Good books, by the way. But she did a whole TED Talk on shame. This is what opened my eyes on this whole idea of shame. And she said that in order for shame to exist, it needs to have silence, secrecy, and judgment. Silence, secrecy, and judgments. And that's exactly what I lived with, with the shame that I had in my life as a child and as, you know, a, an adult, even a young adult, re recognizing that I never even talked about it. And so for us, we've got to look at what lurks in the darkness. Is it shame or is it guilt? And that shame just has no place. So how do we get rid of shame? How do we dispense of the shame that was assigned to us by someone else? And I think that this is a, a big, I think this is a big issue because, um, you know, I think a lot of us don't understand what that nagging thing is on the back of our heads. And it's that shame. It's that nagging sense of something just not being right. So here's what I have for you. The first thing I think that we need to do is we need to name whatever it is that's been bothering us. And if we're calling it the shame of, you know, our family history, the shame of whatever it is, then we need to take a look at that and we need to say, you know what, 
this was my shameful family history. Why am I recounting this to you so you can feel sorry for me? Absolutely not. To let you know that this is something, this is the, I invited shame to, to basically reside with me. I was okay with it because I gave it what it needed. I gave it the silence. I gave it the secrecy, right? I gave it the judgment. This is all it was. This is what I was afraid of. This is the fear that I had. So what we have to do is we need to understand that shame will attack the core of who you are if you allow it to. But if you can see that you are you you're no, you are no longer going to play victim and that you've decided that that's something that's that is, you know, rejected by you, then you can take a look at what this is. And then you should then you can no longer be silent, you speak up. No longer in secret. You've just I've just let how many thousands of people know about my childhood. It's not a secret anymore. And the judgment that I have on it, it just was what happened back then. Where am I today with it? I reject that shame. I reject that shame because it has nothing to do with who I am and the woman I've become. And it will not impact who I am and it will not impact all the things that I do in my life. I recognize, however, sometimes there are things that just trigger just that little bit of shame. And if somebody says shame on you, there it is. You know, I'm like a rabid wolf ready to attack. So I say shame off of you. Take the shame off of you. Reject it. Call it out for what it is and just say, this is old shame that I lived with as a child for, with guilt because I gave it what it needed. I gave it the secrecy. I gave it the darkness. I gave it the judgment so that it could be kept quiet and away from everyone and it's had an impact on my life. Now I feel guilty about this one thing, right? Have you ever had that place where you just feel guilty about one thing or another, you know? Nothing to do with the shame, which we oftentimes confuse, but really you just kind of a guilt trip. I've got a guilt trip about this. I feel guilty because, you know, I still have that. You know, my, I sent my son to military school. I think I've told you that story. I didn't know what to do with him as a single mom. I did not know, he was out of control. He was threatening me, you know? He, he was just, woof, all of it was just a lot. And so, you know, I felt guilt about that and I had to seek forgiveness to my son. He was injured by the, that place. You know, there was a lot of garbage that went on there. But you know, I, I can't go back and fix that. But the guilt I felt from it was awful. The way I sought to fix it was to seek forgiveness. Will guilt come back and kind of poke on me a little bit and say, whoa, you're a really crappy mom because you couldn't figure out how to, you know, raise your own son. You had to send him off to military school. Well, he was starting to get in trouble. He was starting to do a lot of things. I just did not know what to do. There was no one to help me. You know, I reached out to everyone and no one helped me. I reached out to pastors, I reached out everywhere. Didn't know what to do. You know, what does that say? That says I felt helpless. It says I feel guilty about what they did. But here's the thing you need to know, and this is the important part, that at any time when you start to feel guilty about something that you did, you need to take it and take a peek at, at what it is. You need to take a peek at what it is. And then you th say to them, what is it that I can learn from this? Even though you regret it, what can I learn from this? How can I make it right with anybody who was involved? What is it, what's my part in this? When we can participate fully in the consequences, you know, and fixing it the best that we can, that's all we can do. And then the rest is going to have to play out. That's just it. And, and if we think that we can go through our lives unscathed, we are wrong. It's gonna happen. You know, we get, we get wrapped up in these things. We get caught up in these things. But guilt is not the same as shame. And shame is not the same as guilt. We, but they both need to be brought out. They both need to be discussed. And they both need to be righted. Although I would say with shame, the biggest thing that you can do is reject it and decide that this is something simply that you will not carry anymore. It's not your burden. It, you know the burden is? The burden's on the people who put it there on you. 
The burden is on those around who decided that they were going to shame you. We don't have to live with that anymore. So what we need to do is, you know, get past the guilt. First of all, is, is to understand and put the shame in its place. Light it up. Stop talking, you know, stop talking about it. Stop bringing it up. What you think about expands. It's no longer a thing if you make a decision that it isn't. You got that? That's huge. If you decide that shame is no longer yours to carry, then drop it. Drop it like it's hot. If you still have guilt about something, then okay, let's process that guilt and process it the very best that you can. What is the one thing that you haven't done that you could do to change things up? Have you sought forgiveness? Have you tried to make amends? Have you done all the things within your power to do? Because if you have and you're still saddled with guilt, if you're still dealing with all of this, then that's on you. You know, that's on you because you've made a decision not to let it go. All we can do is let go of these things that as they come up, we can only let go of them as long as we've done the work to fix them as best we can. You know, it's like if you're in a motorcycle accident and you lose your leg, you can't grow another leg back, but you can do things to make, you know, that place, that empty place better by buying, getting a prosthetic leg, getting some physical therapy, learning how to walk again. It changes things, but it doesn't alter you know, life forever and ever, amen. It changes things, yes. So the other thing we need to do with shame is we need to allow it, uh, or not shame rather, I'm saying guilt. We need to dispense of shame and we need to take our guilt and process it. You know, I believe processing guilt is the best thing in the world because when we're left with nothing left to do because we've done everything in our power, then it can't hold, you know, it can't hold a, a, a power over us anymore. It can't hold anything over us anymore. That's my sister Lori, by the way, that you're saying hello to. Um, and, and someday I'm gonna tell Lori's story because it's pretty incredible. You know, we, we have, we've got stories. <laughs> we have stories. So we have to feel what it is, we have to feel what's true about the guilt that we have, and then we have to let go of the stuff that's not true. Have you noticed that what guilt does what guilt oftentimes does is it lands on us and then it starts to um, bring some friends. It starts to embellish a little bit. It starts to make us feel even worse than it is. And you're saying, okay, so this guilt is, you know, if you feel guilty about what your son, I've ruined his life. So that was part of my whole, you know, my whole narrative. I've ruined his life. He's never gonna be the same because of something that I did, this, that, and the other thing. And it's simply not true. And you know, the good thing for me was we had, my, my son and I had this big discussion about this and he said, mom, it was what it was and I'm good, I'm fine. And you know, I would have preferred not to have gone to military school, but I did and I'm okay. And the fact is that you and I have a relationship and we do, you know, this was back then. You know, how many of you have had relationships with your teens that have just fractured your family? And yet now, all these years later, you're able to draw back and to, to, you know, get cohesive again. Life teaches us lessons along the way if we're willing to embrace them, if we're willing to call them out, if we're willing to allow how we feel about something in order to correct the situation as best we can. You know, we're all in this together. We are all on this place of having to clean something up. We don't live without making a mess as we go in this life, do we? I've made plenty of messes, but I always go back and clean it up. When I was raising my children, that was the thing, that's what I taught them, you know? I said to, you know, my children, if they knocked over, I never got angry if they knocked something over, you know? Well, I shouldn't say never, I'm sure I did it at some point. But you know, if they knock something over, their biggest lesson, and I taught them this, you know what, when you knock something over, you gotta clean it up. That's on you. Here's the paper towels, here's, here's the, the you know, Windex and whatever, and I teach them how to do it. You don't just tell them to do something, you teach them how to do it. You teach them all these different ways of, of coping. This shows them also how to cope, it trains them how to think, and it shows them responsibility. We all have to do this. 
Because if we clean up after ourselves and we teach our children to clean up after themselves, literally and figuratively, then life is gonna go a whole lot better for us. Because we recognize at any point that we have the ability to clean it up the very best that we can. It doesn't always mean that it's gonna go right back to being the same way it was, you know? And it might be flawed forever and ever. And it might have that little chink in your armor or whatever it is. But if you know this and you understand this and you do this work, this work in your life and the work and in the loving and caring in, in those that you care about, this is loving and caring work, by the way. And you're letting them know and acknowledging their pain because of something that you did, then we can start to dismiss and let go of, of the heaviness of guilt. One thing I think is important is that we insist, is what I wrote down these, my notes on this was to ins insist and resist. We have to insist on calling it out every single time, whether it's, you know, something as big as shame or something as, as you know, unique as a particular type of guilt that you're dealing with. We have to call it out and we have to name what it is. We can't just say, I've got this vague guilt for, oh, I don't know, whatever reason. Why are you feeling guilt? Well, it has to do with this, this, and this. Then who was affected? This person, this person, this person. And what happened afterwards? Well, this was the fallout. And how has this been fixed? How has this been cleaned up? And you have to only look at yourself. Because I promise you, you know, it's happened to me too, and I know it's happened to you. There's a lot of times where people are not going to come back to you and say, you know what, will you forgive me? Because they think they did nothing wrong. And so you have to let that go too. Because if you sit around waiting for somebody to come to you and asking and seeking your forgiveness, chances are you're going to be really bitter. Waiting and waiting. You just have to let that go and allow God to deal with them. That's the biggest thing. My mother taught me that. She actually taught me that. That was part of her work that she did when she was getting sober, you know, is, is just dealing with things and letting go of things that she just could not control. Because at the end of the day, where are we? We're at the place of wanting to be these control monsters for, with our lives, right? And it doesn't always work that way. So insist on calling it out and also per resist putting it on. Resist putting on the shame. If somebody wants to shame you, resist it and shame off of you. Shame is just something that we don't have to choose. Got that? Guilt needs to be dealt with. Shame needs to be rebuffed. That's it. Because never, ever, ever again do I want you to walk with your head hung low. Walk with your head held high, woman. <laughs> this is what wise women do. With your head held high. Knowing who you are, who, you, who created you in the first place, and who put you here on purpose right now at this time for a reason. It's God himself. And he doesn't shame those he loves. He does not. The imperfect people around you, they're gonna try and they're gonna attempt. The guilt that you feel may or may not be appropriate. Judge it by the fact that, you know, is it something that you have dealt with or not? And then deal with it. Promise me you'll deal with it this week, whatever it is. Maybe there's somebody in your past that you even need to write a letter to. Even if they're past, they've passed away. Write that letter anyway. And just make amends for the things that you've done in your life because we've all made mistakes. We've all made messes. And promise me this, that you will teach your children to clean up after themselves. Teach them. Train them. And show them with a living, breathing example. This is how we become the wise women we want to be. This is how we become and get past and leave that stuff behind. You with me on that? This is a pinkies up, girls. Pinkies up. Well, I hope that helped somebody here today. You know, I always, I always think if just one person hears something that that is that is meaningful and that they can take um, and use in their lives, then. I've, I've done good work. <laughs> I so appreciate all of you and I really appreciate the fact that you hang in there with me 
and that you join me on a regular basis and that you are um, the beautiful souls that you are. And I wish you a blessed Sunday. Share this video if it, if it clicked, if anything clicked inside for you. And by the way, um, tomorrow is Monday. It's Motivational Monday and we're going to start the week off with a bang. I hope to see ya. Cheers. Peace be with you.